For six whole days, spree shooter Raoul Moat was the most wanted man in Britain. He was armed, he was dangerous, and police didn't know what he was gonna do next. And what followed was the biggest manhunt ever recorded in British history. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about the infamous spree shooter, Raoul Mert. But before we get into it, I do just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, NordVPN. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, the link is also down below in the description, you'll find an exclusive deal waiting there for you and it is completely risk free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. I personally use a VPN every single time I use the internet. And I'll tell you why, because the internet is a scary place and you don't know who's out there. There's hackers out there, there's people trying to access your information and I think it's better to be safe than sorry. One of the easiest ways to protect yourself online is by using a VPN. You can choose from over 60 different countries on the NordVPN map to connect to and they will make it appear as though you're operating from an IP address within that country so that your own IP address is protected. So not only are you safe to browse the internet, but this also means that you get to access the internet as though you're in that country that you chose. And this comes with so many other benefits in itself, you get access to everything that that country has access to. Their streaming service selections, their news platforms, games that are available only in their country. Even YouTube videos that might be blocked in your country that might be available in that country. I know a lot of my YouTube videos are blocked in different countries. I've always thought that getting a VPN is just a no brainer because it just unlocks a whole other side to the internet that you haven't had access to this whole time just because of where you live. Oh, and by the way, it also works the other way around. So if you go and travel in this summer, like I know a lot of people will be, you can then go back home using the VPN, set it to your home country so that you can keep up to date with all your shows, all your different things that you've got going on back home. And like I said, NordVPN have an exclusive deal waiting for you guys at nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. The link is also down below in the description and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. This case does have a lot of content warnings, so I'm just going to list them off, listen carefully, and if any of the following are things that you don't want to hear about right now, I completely understand. Click out this video now. The content warnings are as follows. Animal abuse, drug abuse, alcoholism, disordered eating and exercise, sexual assault, rape, and suicide. So like I said, if any of that is something that you don't wanna hear about right now, click out. Hopefully I'll get a chance to see you some other time with a different case. But all of that being said, Let's talk about the manhunt of Ralmert. So today's case takes place mainly in Newcastle, but pretty much the whole northeast of England in 2010. Uh, this, like I've been saying, is one of the most notorious cases in UK true crime history. Raoul Mert is like the boogeyman over here. Everyone knows that name. So let's take it back to when he was first born on June 17th, 1973. Raoul's father actually left his mother before they even found out that she was pregnant with Raoul. So she actually went through this whole entire pregnancy completely alone. She didn't tell his father that he even had a child or that she was gonna have his baby. And eventually when she did give birth, to Raoul Thomas Mert, she completely refused to acknowledge that his father even existed. There was no father's name on Raoul's birth certificate when he was born. She never reached out to the father to let him know that he had a son and the father was just completely oblivious. I don't know at what point the father found out that he had a son, but he did at some point. And so he got in touch with Raoul's mother, Josephine, and he was saying, okay, I wanna, I wanna meet my son. I wanna be in his life. But Josephine didn't want him there. She said that they were doing just fine without him and so she blocked every attempt that Raoul's father made to be in his life. The father tried multiple, multiple times over the years and Raoul was none the wiser. He was raised thinking that he didn't have a father and that his father didn't care about him and that his father didn't want to be in his life 
when that wasn't true. Every time he would try and ask his mother about his father, she would just shut him down. She wouldn't tell him anything. She would say, oh, he doesn't matter. So as he grew up, Ral Mutt always longed for a father. He desperately wanted a father figure in his life, but he never even had that in the form of like a granddad or an uncle or a stepfather. And he would go to school and all the other kids would be talking about their dads and the amazing things that they would get up to with their parents. And he was just so jealous of all these other kids that had that, that it led him to actually make up a fake father in his head that he would then tell the kids about. He would tell all his friends all these amazing stories about his dad who was a French man that came over to England when he was a baby and all this kind of stuff because he just desperately wanted to fit in and feel like he had a dad. Raoul Mort came from a very poor family. It was just his mother and her single parent paycheck paying for both him and his older brother Angus. And they really, really struggled. They did not have enough money to live and their financial situation only got worse and worse over the years until eventually they were forced to have to move house to a to a cheaper area in Newcastle's West End. And at the time, Newcastle's West End was not a nice place to live at all. It was very impoverished. It was very, I guess you could say it was quite rough. It was quite dirty. There's a reason it was so cheap. It was not a desirable place for people to live at all, but people lived there out of necessity because it was the cheapest housing that they could get. And these were all people that could not afford to survive anywhere else. So now there's Raoul, his brother and their mother living in this like small rickety little flat in Newcastle's West End. And things just kept getting worse and worse for them as a family. Their mother Josephine had bipolar disorder and she'd had it for most of her life. She got the diagnosis quite early. So she'd had it before she even had kids. But now with all these different factors in her life, looking after two children, the financial issues, her mental health just started spiraling out of control. In fact, Raoul Mutt's earliest memory of his mother was when she was in a manic episode, lighting all of his toys on fire, his and his brothers, and she forced them to sit and watch as all of their toys burned in front of them. And I imagine this was quite traumatic for two young children. These are all of their possessions that they love, that they're attached to. They don't understand what's going on and they're forced to sit and watch them burn to ashes. And had things continued in that trajectory, I imagine these two children would have had an incredibly turbulent childhood. But luckily, help stepped in. Raoul's grandmother, so Josephine's own mother, noticed that her daughter was just not in a fit state to be raising children at this point in her life. Her mental health needed to be her sole focus. And so the grandmother offered to take the kids off her hands and let them come and live with her. And from then on, life was a lot more calm and stable for Ralmo and his brother. They still got to see their mother a lot. She actually only lived like two streets away. So they would still see her almost every single day. Although now it was just a lot healthier because they didn't have to witness her her episodes. Over the years, Josephine successfully got help for her mental health. She was doing much better. She even met a new man and remarried. And so now when he was reintroduced into his mother's life, into their home life, there was a man there. There was a, a father there now. But when Raoul Mutt finally got that father figure that he'd been longing for, that he'd been dreaming about for years, he was sorely disappointed. Now, I don't know much about this man, but sources say that he was quite a cold man. He didn't make a lot of effort with the children. So, I mean, there was a father figure there, but Raoul didn't really like him. It, was, it wasn't what he wanted. But this disappointment aside, Raoul Mutt managed to live a relatively happy and calm childhood. After the point that he moved out of his mother's house, everything seemed to be rosy. That was until he reached his teenage years and he started getting these traumatic recurring nightmares nearly every single night. In this nightmare, Raoul was a young boy again, about seven or eight years old, and he was being chased down the street that he grew up on by a load of monsters. And no matter how fast he ran, no matter what he did, he could not get away from them. But I find this recurring nightmare very interesting for a number of reasons. The significance of him being a young boy again, every single time, the significance of it taking place on the street that he grew up on, I think it symbolizes that he still has a lot of trauma 
that he is carrying with him from his childhood. His childhood is still haunting him as he's growing up. Also around this time in his teenage years, Ralmert developed some seemingly disordered eating and exercise habits. Nothing was ever diagnosed as far as I'm aware, but Ralmert became unhealthily obsessed with a healthy lifestyle. He was clean eating, he was exercising, over-exercising all the time. And I think this developed out of a need for control. Ralmert never felt like he was in control of his life and his diet and exercise was one of the very few things that he had full control over. His main fixation actually after a while was in building muscle, so much so that he started taking steroids and yes, they did have the desired effect of you know growing his muscles, making him bigger, but that came at the cost of some horrendous side effects. He became very aggressive, very volatile, even sometimes violent. Violent. He became a very angry man with a short temper because of these steroids. And because of this new short temper that he had, he found it very hard to hold down a job in his adult life. He would constantly get fired from all these different jobs because people didn't like him and people didn't get on with him. He had so many different jobs, I'll list them all now. Milkman, tree surgeon, a mechanic. And actually his most successful job was as a nightclub bouncer. He managed to keep this job for the longest amount of time. And as I'm sure you can imagine, he loved that job because he could exercise a lot of power, a lot of control. He loved being aggressive and intimidating because he loved the power that it gave him over other people. And also it gave him an excuse to be on the steroids and building a lot more muscle, I suppose. Being a doorman at a club, you need to be like quite big and strong and intimidating. At this point in his life, after he'd lost that job, I have a quote from his mum here. She said, all of a sudden he got a job at an engineering company and that's where all the silliness started. Because it seemed at this point, Raoul Mert's life took a complete like 180 shift and everything just started crashing down around him. By now, he was abusing steroids worse than ever. He'd grown to be about 17 stone, which is about 240 pounds. He was massive. And by now he was so aggressive, so temperamental, that it was ruining every relationship in his life with his brother, with his mother, everyone didn't want to be around him anymore and people started distancing themselves from Raoul. He just couldn't live a single day of his life without an argument and he never saw himself as the issue even though he was the common thing between all of these relationships that were falling apart. He always somehow managed to blame the other person. The other person was always at fault. He was always the victim. Yeah, he thought that everyone else was the problem and so his solution to this was to just up and move away and start a new life, meet new people. He didn't move very far, he just moved to Newcastle city centre, but he got his own flat there, cut off everyone in his life, and actually for the next like, what, 10 years, his mother Josephine never heard from him again, never. And she was so worried about him as well, because she did want to be in his life. She loved her son, even though he was becoming not a very nice person at this point, she still loved him. And so actually when he did cut her off and he never spoke to anyone ever again, his mother Josephine got in contact with the Salvation Army and said, look, I've got this son, please will you try and track him down and make sure he's okay. And I think they did. I think Salvation Army managed to get in contact with Raoul Mert and he just shut him down. He was like, yeah, I don't want to speak to my mum. Please leave me alone. So yeah, by now he had cut off his whole previous life. He was living in Newcastle alone. I don't think he had a job. He had nothing to do. And so he started filling his days with very weird, weird, weird things. So one time he approached an 18 year old girl at quite a crowded bus stop and he forced her to put on a jester's hat and hold up a sign that said, I've been naughty. And he found this really funny. He was laughing his head off. He was trying to humiliate this girl and everyone around at the bus stop could tell she felt so intimidated, so anxious, but he thought this was the funniest thing in the world. And then he just left. Like what? What was all that about? Just a really weird, creepy interaction. I don't think that's necessarily illegal. I'm sure there's something in there that's illegal, but don't worry, he did much more illegal things as well. On one occasion, he ran into a young girl stealing food from a shop, by the way. A young person stealing food. That probably means that they are just trying to survive, but Ralmo decided to be a 
vigilante here. He took this girl, tied her to a chair, tied her up to this chair, bound her, and then left her there as punishment. He just left. I don't know how she got untied. I don't know who untied her, but yeah. This poor young girl. But it wasn't just young girls that Raoul Mert would randomly abuse like this. He would do it to animals too. There was one particular time where he beat a dog so severely that it couldn't walk. It couldn't, it couldn't do anything. He just left it on the side of the road for dead. Raoul Mert was obsessed with exercising his power, his strength, his intimidation over weaker beings, people that he knew couldn't fight him back, so young girls or animals. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this power-hungry personality also translated into his romantic relationships. Raoul Mert was a very abusive partner to every girlfriend he ever had. The first of which was a woman named Caroline who actually had a couple of children to a previous relationship. And Raoul was fine with that. He started seeing her, he, he wasn't necessarily like a father figure to her children, but he didn't mind them. Like he'd hang out with them, he'd go places with them, but then, Caroline fell pregnant with Raoul's own baby and this is where he had an issue. He didn't wanna be a father and so he demanded that she got an abortion but Caroline didn't want one. She was like, no, like I, this is my baby too. I want to be able to have this baby. But that was when Raoul told her that if she didn't get that abortion, he would kill that unborn baby himself. And this absolutely horrified Caroline. This made her see Ralmo in a completely different light. She didn't know he had it in him to say or even follow through on things like that. And she knew that that wasn't the kind of man that she would want to be raising a child around anyway. So she left Raoul Mert as quick as she possibly could, got her kids away from him, and she actually took out an injunction against him, which is kind of like a restraining order. And she ended up keeping the baby, actually, and she went on to have a little baby girl, and I don't think Raoul Mert ever met his daughter, which, is definitely for the best. Raoul's longest relationship was with a woman named Marissa. The two of them were together for nine years and they actually had two children together. And this time around, Raoul was a lot more welcoming of the pregnancies. He was in more of a place to be an active father figure in these children's lives. But don't get me wrong, just because he was an active father figure didn't mean he was a good father. In fact, he was a terrible father. Raoul was emotionally, physically, and sexually abusive towards his girlfriend, Marissa. I don't know if he was towards the children, but they certainly witnessed him being that way with their mother, which is traumatic enough in itself. Eventually, after nine long years of this abusive hell, Marissa finally built up the courage to leave Raoul Mert and take their two daughters with her and Raoul was angered beyond belief about this. Not because he cared about Marissa leaving, though. I actually think he couldn't have cared less if Marissa was in his life or not. What he cared about was that she was taking the children. Because going back to his need for power and control, I think he viewed those two girls as his possessions. They were his daughters, and how dare Marissa take that away from him? How dare she take his possessions? Basically, I don't think he was upset about losing his family. I think he was upset about losing the control that he had over his family. And he got it in his head that he was gonna get those daughters back whether Marissa liked it or not. And so in 2006, Raoul Mert effectively kidnapped his own two daughters, took them back to his house and made them live with him. Marissa went to the police about this and she tried to tell them what an abusive person Raoul Mert was, but police couldn't technically do anything because Raoul was one of the children's legal guardians. I don't know the ins and outs of this, but for some reason they couldn't get those kids back. Raoul had won. He got to keep custody of those two girls. And in fact, he only let Marissa see them on weekends, which absolutely broke her, especially knowing how abusive that man was. And now his daughters are in his care. She was so worried about what he could do to them. And over time, Raoul Mert brainwashed his two daughters into hating their mother. He turned them against their own mother. He would tell them all kinds of lies about how she used to abuse them when they were babies, 
I don't think she ever did. He would tell them that their mum's a drug dealer and that she's got loads of guns and that she's like really reckless and none of it was true. But arguably one of the worst things that he told the kids was that their mother didn't want to see them. He told them that it was Marissa's decision to only see them on weekends because she didn't want to be in their lives. And so those daughters grew up thinking that their mum didn't care about them, that their mum didn't want them, that their mum was this awful person, this criminal, and that their dad was this shining light angel being that had saved them, rescued them, and given them the childhood that they deserved. Of course, those daughters had no idea what the real situation was. They could only believe what their father was telling them. The lies and the brainwashing only got worse and worse and worse with time until eventually, one day, Ralmo took his eldest daughter to the police station to try and use her against her mother. Raul basically told the police that his daughter had witnessed her mother hiding in bushes with a gun. So of course, police took this very, very seriously. They took the daughter into an interview room without Raul Mert, and they were asking her all about like her mom and what she'd seen. And as they were asking these questions, they noticed that not everything was adding up. So they asked her like where all this had come from and she proceeded to tell them, daddy told me in the car. Raul Mert had told his daughter everything to say to the police and now he was caught in this lie. The plan was foiled. But despite this failed attempt to ruin Marissa, Raul was back at it again just a few months later using the exact same trick. This time he took his younger daughter to the police station and had her tell the police, mammy stabbed daddy with a knife. So again, police took this very seriously. They started interviewing the daughter and again, they start poking holes in the story and they find out that it's all a lie for the second time. And what's crazy is, I don't think Raul Moat saw any consequences for doing this, for wasting police time, for, for trying to lie about this woman, for using his daughters in this way. I don't think there were any repercussions at all. After this second attempt, Marissa asked Raul herself, why are you doing this to me? And he responded, it's just to screw you over. It's not about the kids. It's not about the money. I'm doing it to get at you. Again, power, control, intimidation. That's how he gets his kicks in life. He doesn't care about anything else. He tried again a couple of months later. This time he called the police himself and he told them that he was worried for his daughter's safety while they were staying at their mother's house because she was a drug dealer. She had loads of guns. She left these guns just out on the side while the girls were around. And so of course, police had to take this very seriously. They got a search warrant for the house. They went there, they ransacked it, looked up and down, but there were no drugs, no guns, nothing. And so finally, after this third misunderstanding, police sat down with Marissa and they were like, look, we can tell that he's lying about you. He keeps trying to make up these lies and get you into trouble. Why? Why is he so out to get you? And that was when Marissa confided in them all of the abuse that she'd faced throughout that nine year relationship. I actually have some quotes from her statement here and they are quite triggering. So you might wanna skip forward maybe like half a minute if you don't wanna hear about this. So Marissa told police, when I was too tired to have sex, he got angry, dragged me into the living room, pushed me into the wall face first, grabbed my hair and smashed my face off his knee. He then threw me onto the floor, got a baseball bat and pressed it against my throat. His face was horrible, screwed up and twisted with anger. He was trying to kill me. Marissa was actually hospitalized after this particular incident that she was describing there. And she was in such a bad way. Her face was literally black and blue with bruises. And when Raul walked into her hospital room and saw her, he just laughed at her. So now police believe Marissa. They're definitely on her side. They understand that Raul Mote is the horrible one in this situation, but the daughters, obviously because they're so young, so brainwashed, they don't see both sides of this they're very much still on their father's side. They saw Marissa as this awful monster that didn't love them, didn't care about them, and they never wanted to see her again. They hated their mother. But anyway, in the meantime, Raul Mert had found himself a new girlfriend. At this point, he was 31 years old, and this new girlfriend was 16. 16, half his age. 
not too much older than his daughters. Literally a child. She is not yet 18 years old. She is a child in the eyes of the law. Literally only just reached the age of legal consent and he is in his 30s. Her name was Samantha Stobart and after a short while of being together, she fell pregnant and gave Ralmut another baby, a daughter named Chanel. And through this whole relationship, Raoul was treating Samantha the same way that he treated all of his other exes. He was manipulative, he was physically abusive, sexually abusive, and the abuse was only getting worse with time as it had with the other relationships. And Samantha knew she wanted to get out, she knew she had to escape, but at this point, she was still very, very young. She just had a baby. She was working as a trainee hairstylist. So she wasn't even a full hairstylist yet. She was still on trainee wages and she didn't have the money to get away from him and get to safety. It took her months, if not years, to finally save up enough money from her very small paychecks to be able to get away from him. But eventually she managed it. She saved up enough and took her daughter and left Raoul Mert. And this was a very, very messy separation. Raoul was trying all his usual manipulation tactics to, to ruin Samantha's life and try and get her back and try and win custody of Chanel, but none of it was working. And then he hit a fork in the road because around this time when he was desperately trying to get Samantha and Chanel back, he was sent to prison for the assault of a nine-year-old relative. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of this one and I really wish I did because this sounds horrendous. I don't know what he did. I don't know what the context of that assault was, but he was sent to prison for four months for this. Finally, Raoul Moat wasn't a constant worry in Samantha's life, in Marissa's life, in anyone's life. People could finally breathe that life was finally calm without this man around. And Samantha started to build up her life now without Raoul in it. She ended up meeting a new man named Chris Brown. He was a 29 year old karate instructor. They got on really well and they started a, an official relationship together. And Samantha was very open with Chris about the whole Ralmo situation, about their relationship, how abusive he was, how intimidating he was. And she said that she was worried that when he gets out of prison after this four months, he's gonna try and come back for her. And unfortunately, she was right. Raoul Mert was released from prison on July 1st, 2010. And very quickly, news made its way to him that his ex-girlfriend, Samantha Stobart, had moved on to someone new. And he was furious about it. So furious, in fact, that he decided to hatch a revenge plan. So the very next day, he got in contact with his friend named Carl Ness, who owned a van, and he asked if Carl could drive him around in that van all night. Side note here, I don't know how much Carl Ness actually knew about what he was about to be involved in. Sources say different things. Some sources say that Raoul Moat didn't tell him anything and that he just thought he was doing a friend a favor, whereas other sources think he very much knew what the revenge plan was and he was happy to be a part of it. Based on Carl Ness's own stories later on in this case that you will hear, it's very clear what story he's going with, but whether he's telling the truth is a different different thing. But anyway, Raoul Merck gets in contact with Carl Ness. He says, can I borrow your van? Like, will you drive me around in your van? Carl says, yeah, sure. So that evening, well, actually more like the early hours of the next morning, so it was July 3rd at this point, Carl Ness goes and picks up Raoul Moe in the van and they start driving around. He directed Carl to the street where Samantha Stobart lived. And when they got there, Carl parked the van on the very edge of the street while Raoul Moe got out on foot and walked to Samantha's house. The plan was that Carl was just gonna wait there in the van while Raoul did what he was about to do. And then when he was done, Raoul would return to the van and Carl could then drive him home. So off he went. Raoul Mert creeped up to Samantha Stobart's house, found a bush in her front garden and hid in it and waited. He had a perfect view of her front door and he was just waiting there and watching it. In his hand, he had a shotgun and a bag of homemade bullets. He sat there, loaded the gun, and waited. And he was sat there for ages until like 2.40 a.m. when suddenly he was caught by surprise. 
A door opened, but it wasn't Samantha's. It was her next door neighbour's. And Samantha and her boyfriend Chris walked out. They'd spent the night at the neighbour's house. So Chris Brown left the house first and he was walking down the driveway, closely followed by Samantha behind him. But at this point, Samantha noticed that someone was lurking in the bushes. She shouted a warning to her boyfriend, but at this point, it was already too late. Raoul Mote had jumped up out of this bush, aimed the gun at Samantha, and he was about to shoot. In a split second, Chris instinctively threw himself in front of Samantha Stobart, just as Raoul Mote fired the gun and the bullet hit Chris. Samantha and the neighbors turned and ran inside the neighbor's house as quickly as they possibly could, but at this point, it was already too late for Chris. He was already bleeding out heavily and he was stumbling around, he was disorientated, he couldn't take himself inside the house. Raoul Mert then took this opportunity to soak up all of this power and control that he had in this situation. Everyone was terrified of him, everyone was intimidated by him, no one was going to try and stop him. And so he walked slowly down that driveway, laughing at Chris, teasing him, taunting him, knowing that Chris can't escape. When Raoul approached him, he lifted the gun once again, pointed it at his head and shot him a second time at point blank range, killing him instantly. Now that Chris Brown was out of the way, Raoul then turned his attentions back to Samantha Stobart, who was the intended target of this. That was who he wanted to shoot in the first place. And right now, she was inside the neighbor's house and he could see her through the living room window. I think her and the neighbors were on the phone to police at this point. Once again, Raoul Mo lifted that gun, aimed through the window and shot twice through the window at Samantha before turning and fleeing the scene. He ran all the way down to the end of the street where Carl Ness was supposed to be parked in the van waiting for him. But when Raoul got there, the van was nowhere to be seen. He'd been ditched, Carl had left him, and now Raoul had no getaway plan. He had no other choice than to just keep running and try and flee the scene on foot. He ran all the way to the nearest town and eventually flagged down a taxi that I think just took him straight home. So it turned out that Carl Ness had been parked in that van at the end of the street for the first half of the attack anyway, but as soon as he heard gunshots coming from down the street, he panicked. He supposedly didn't know that Raoul Mert had even brought a gun and that his plan was to shoot. And now Carl is stressed in the car thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna be implicated in a murder here. I need to get away. And so he drove away. He didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, I don't know. Some people have their own opinions that maybe he was just lying to get a potentially lower sentence in court at the end of this, but who knows? Meanwhile, back at the neighbor's house, Chris Brown was already dead, laying in the driveway. There was no saving him. Samantha had been shot twice. He hit her twice, once in the arm and once directly in the stomach that was causing her to bleed profusely. She was turning ghost white and luckily they'd actually already called for an ambulance and police after the shots were fired at Chris. So there was already an ambulance on the way. When it got there, they transported Samantha to hospital and she was treated. She had to remain in hospital for days afterwards. She had to undergo so many different surgeries because this gunshot wound, I think it had mainly affected her liver, but there was a lot of internal damage from that one bullet. And in in fact, when she was in hospital being treated for this, police really feared that Raoul Mote might try and come back for her and, and finish what he started. And so there were armed guards guarding Samantha Stobart's hospital room for the whole time that she was there. So this shooting had taken place around 3 a.m. in the early hours of the morning and about five or six hours later when everyone was waking up the next day, this was already headline news. Everyone was finding out about this. And right now, Raoul Mote was still out there somewhere. They hadn't caught him. They didn't know where he was, but they knew that he was armed, dangerous and potentially gonna harm other people if they didn't catch him. Police were doing what they could to try and search for him, but right now they had zero leads 
Absolutely none. They had no idea where he could have gone. There were no witnesses to this attack that like saw where he went. All police could really do was campaign to the public for any potential witnesses or anyone that knew anything to come forward to them. Because right now police, they didn't know what to do. And luckily by lunchtime that day, so this investigation had only been going for a few hours, they received their first lead. It was actually from one of Raoul Mote's friends saying that they'd just seen Raoul. He'd just been round at their house. So police went straight to the house to go and speak to this friend while a bunch of other officers just like circled the area. They were just driving everywhere to see if they could find him. They couldn't. But meanwhile, police speaking with this friend got a lot of useful information. The friend's name was Andy McAllister. Um, I don't think he was a very close friend of Raoul Mertz, but he was an old friend. Um, and he said that randomly that day, Raoul had just knocked on the door and he was like, can I, can I come in? Can I come and talk to you? And Andy was like, oh, okay. It was quite a surprise. He wasn't expecting to see Raoul Mertz. I don't know if he saw him often, but yeah, he invited him in anyway. At this point, obviously, Andy McAllister hadn't seen the news. He didn't know that Raoul Mertz was a wanted man at this point in time. So this interaction, as far as he was aware, was about to be a normal interaction. You know, just an old friend coming to his house, they were gonna catch up over a cup of tea or something, but quickly things got very weird. Raoul sat there and confessed to Andy McAllister what he'd just done, that he'd just shot two people, but he wasn't confessing it in like a, a stressed, like guilt-ridden kind of way where he's just trying to get it off his chest. If anything, he seemed proud of what he'd just done. In fact, in Raoul Mote's own words, he said it lifted a huge cloud off his shoulders and now he was full of beans. So Andy McAllister's sat there, he's just listened to all of this and he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to say. And he he tells Raoul Mote that he needs to give himself in. Like he needs to go to the police about this. He's not gonna get away with murder. So the sooner he hands himself in, the better chance he has of getting a lower prison sentence. But Raoul didn't wanna hear it. He wasn't there for advice. He didn't care what Andy thought he should do. Raoul had already made his decision that he was on the run now. So he got up to leave Andy's house, but before he did, he handed him a letter. This like 40 something page handwritten letter that we'll get back to in a minute, but Andy gave this letter to the police. Raoul didn't tell Andy where he was headed after that. And so police didn't really have many leads to go off. Um, based on this conversation, but it was useful to know that this had happened. Around 2 p.m. that day, so this is about 12 hours after the shooting in the early hours of the morning, police publicly announced on the news, breaking news, that they were officially starting this serious manhunt for Raoul Mote, and he was currently the most wanted man in Britain. The next major development that happened in this case was at about midnight that night, so almost 24 hours in, when police received a phone call from Raoul Mote himself. He said, hello there, this is the gunman from Bertley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Mote. What I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done. My girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back with one of your officers, the gentleman I shot last night. I'm hunting for officers now. It seemed that Raoul Mote thought that Samantha Stobart's new boyfriend, Chris Brown, that he had just murdered was a police officer. He wasn't. He was a karate instructor, like I said earlier. But there is a reason that Raoul Mote thought he was a police officer. And that was because while Raoul was still in prison and Samantha had met Chris, she was telling him all about Raoul. She was saying, oh, I'm so worried for when he leaves prison after this. I think he's gonna come after me. Chris came up with an idea. They decided to pretend that Chris was a police officer. They started posting as if he was on social media. They went around telling everyone that he was a policeman because if that got back to Raoul Mott, that his ex-girlfriend, Samantha, was now with a policeman, it might scare him away from, you know, potentially going after her again. It might put him off wanting to cause further harm. That clearly hadn't worked though. And if anything, it seemed to have only further aggravated him because now he's telling police that he is gonna start targeting other police officers because of Chris Brown. So yeah, Raoul Mert basically says on the phone that now I'm gonna start targeting police officers and he just puts the phone down 
and police don't hear from him again. He just continued on the run after that call and quite surprisingly, he was just acting very normal in his life. He was acting as if he hadn't just committed murder. He was just going and meeting up with friends, mooching about town, going for food. Just 12 minutes after that phone call, 12 minutes after Raoul Mo hung up that phone, he and two of his friends were just driving around, just, just driving. I really don't think he had a plan I don't think a lot of people that just suddenly go on the run from police do. I don't think they have a plan and I think they just drive around until they figure something out. So that's what he was doing right now. He was in the car with two friends. They come to this roundabout when all of a sudden Raoul Mert noticed a police car just parked on the side of the roundabout. I think it was just a traffic officer who was just observing the roundabout, making sure that everything was going smoothly. But remember, Raoul Mutt now had it out for police officers. So he had just spotted his next target. Inside that police car was a 42 year old traffic officer named David Rathband. And he, just like every other officer in the whole entire police force at this point in time, he was very aware of the manhunt for Raoul Mutt that was going on right now. He'd actually been specifically briefed to be on the lookout for a white van. So that's what he was looking for because that's the vehicle that they believed Raoul Mert was driving. Little did he know, Raoul was being driven around in a black Lexus. Pretty much the complete opposite kind of vehicle. So when this black Lexus starts circling the roundabout over and over again, David Rathband didn't realize. And on that last circle around the roundabout, Raoul Mert had made his way to the passenger side of the car rolled down the window, lifted the gun, and was aiming it right at David Rathband in his car. Before David could even react, Raoul Mert shot him straight in the face. David slumped back in this chair while Raoul and his two friends in the black Lexus sped away. Using what little strength he had left at that point, David was actually able to call for help on his police radio. He simply just said across this radio, I've been shot. So an ambulance came out, transported David Rathband to hospital and he did survive, but he did have some long lasting complications from this that we'll get back to a little bit later on in the case. But going back to the timeline, about an hour or two after that second shooting, Raoul Mook calls the police himself again and this time he complained that police are not taking me seriously enough. The dispatcher tried to tell him like, no, you are being taken very seriously. You are the most wanted man in Britain. Police are doing everything they can to track you down. And they were like pleading with him to just give himself over. But Raoul Mert just put the phone down. And following this second shooting, police and the public were even more terrified than they were in the first place because David Rathband had been a total stranger to Raoul Mert. He was just shooting anyone now, people that he didn't even have like a personal vendetta against or a personal reason for shooting. It seemed that he was just shooting strangers, anyone and everyone that he came across. So now people were terrified because anyone could be next. Raoul's ex-girlfriends and all of his children were all deemed potential targets. And so they were all put under like police protection. They were all transported, evacuated out of their houses and put into different places for their own safety, for their protection. Meanwhile, police back at the station had been doing a bit more of a digital investigation into Raoul Mert. They'd been looking at his social media and stuff. And that was when they came across his latest Facebook status. He posted it just before the first shooting of Chris and Samantha. He wrote, just got out of jail. I've lost everything. Watch and see what happens. By July 5th, it was 48 hours into this manhunt, just two days, and police needed reinforcements fast because they knew that Raoul Mote was armed, dangerous, and willing to shoot anyone. Literally anyone and everyone in the whole Northeast of England was in danger, was a potential target at that point in time. And they needed more armed officers out and about on the street, just in case. So at the peak of this manhunt, 10% of all of the armed officers in the whole of the UK were brought to this one specific area in the Northeast because they needed armed officers literally just walking on the streets because they didn't know where or when Raoul Mort was gonna pop up again. But it wasn't just armed officers that were involved in this. Police were throwing 
all their funding, all their resources into this one manhunt. They had sniffer dogs, they had obviously the armed police. They even had like helicopters above with like heat cameras because they were like scanning the countryside to see if he was out there like trying to hide out. Because actually that was their main theory at this point in the case. They thought that he was sleeping rough in like a random field or in the woods or in the countryside, something. Because they hadn't heard from him in the towns in a while. They hadn't had any sightings or anything like that. So they thought it made sense that he might be like, I don't know, camping somewhere. Anyway, it was about this time in the investigation, about two days in, when police let the public Public know that they had that letter from Raoul Moore. Do you remember the one that he gave to his mate Andy and then he gave it to the police? Not gonna lie, a lot of this letter was very, very rambly. It was 40 something pages and I really do not know 95% of the content of that letter. But what I do know is that there was a warning to police in there that said they were gonna pay for what they've done. Raoul also went on to say that the public need not fear me, but the police should as I won't stop till I'm dead. He says he's just gonna keep going after to police officers keep shooting them, keep killing them, until one of them kills him. I find the whole um, fixation on police officers quite interesting here as well though, because obviously he's doing it because he thought that Chris Brown was a police officer, but at the same time, what does Chris Brown's job have to do with the fact that he stole Raoul Moat's girlfriend? Even though he didn't, but there's, th that's obviously how Raoul Moat is seeing it. His job is just so irrelevant to that whole situation. What does his job have to do with his love life? I don't know. But for some reason, Raoul Moat was very fixated on getting revenge against the police. He also acknowledged throughout this massive 40 something page letter that he was really struggling mentally. He said that he had a lot of issues and he acknowledged that he needed help, but he was running out of options. He felt like he had no other choice than to, I don't know, do this, go on a spree shooting for some reason. On the second day of this whole ordeal, Samantha Stobart actually did a public appeal from her hospital bed, but she was literally pleading with Raoul Mert saying, please give yourself up. If you loved me and our baby, you would not be doing this. Later on that same evening, so we're coming up on three days at this point, police found out that Raoul Mert was in the black Lexus and not a white van. So they released that to the public and they told everyone to be on the lookout for this black Lexus. And all of a sudden the lead start pouring in, the most notable of which came in around 10.30 p.m. that night from a fish and chip shop saying that Raoul Moat himself had just robbed them. And then the next morning on July 6th, that black Lexus was found abandoned just in some random field. Because obviously by now, police are looking for it. Raoul Moat knows he cannot keep that same getaway vehicle. He had to find a new one. When police found the abandoned black Lexus, they like cordoned off that whole area. Because I think it was just found in some random field. And they worried that maybe Raoul Moat could be around it. Like he could be in those fields. That could be where he was camping out. Because that was the theory. So they cordon off this massive area around the black Lexus and they're searching it. There's no sign of Raoul Moat, but they do find his two accomplices that he was driving around in that Lexus with. The first of which was Carl Ness, you know, the getaway driver that abandoned Raoul Moat halfway through the first shooting. And the other of the two men was Kuram Arwan, who was the owner and driver of the black Lexus. So of course he was also involved in this whole thing now. So police arrested both of these men. They tried to ask them where Raoul Moat was, but they said they had no idea at this point. He had fled. They had no, like they had no way of contacting him, anything. By July 8th, it had been five days now, five days into this investigation and still Raoul Mutt is nowhere to be seen. He hasn't contacted anyone, hasn't posted anything. Police were starting to get quite worried because at that point he could be anywhere. Like he could have even left the Northeast of England. He could be in London by now and they had no idea. But luckily, by midday of that day, there'd been two separate sightings of Raoul Moat in Newcastle. So police knew that he was close by. In fact, the second of these two sightings was really, really interesting. It was from a news anchor. This woman had been literally reporting on the Raoul Moat case, as had every other news anchor in the whole country at this point. They'd gone out and she was like broadcasting live, you know, when they do it just like in the middle of the street. But after the broadcast had finished, they noticed that in the background of this clip, as she's talking about Raoul Moat, Raoul Moat walks behind her. 
in in this news broadcast. And it seemed he knew that he was gonna be in the background of that because he was like creepy lurking. I think he like made eye contact with the camera at one point. He was intentionally there because power, control, obviously. How eerie is that, that he was hanging around in plain sight, literally in the background of a broadcast about his own manhunt. The next day on July 9th, police got as close to Raoul Mott as they had ever been at any point in this investigation when they found out that he was camping out at a National Trust park named Cragside. So police went down to Cragside, they cordoned off the whole thing. They had it surrounded by police vehicles. And then they put out an announcement to people in the local area to stay inside. Do not leave your houses until we have caught Raoul Moat because he could, he could be anywhere. He could do anything right now. So they had all the helicopters, RAF jets, heat cameras, everything going over the top of this park. And eventually they located him. They got a specific area that they could focus on and they started moving in. But they had to be extremely careful because obviously not only was this man armed and dangerous, but he was also specifically targeting police officers. Any one of those officers in the whole area was putting their life at risk doing this. They had him surrounded in that park for hours and hours and hours and hours, but they couldn't do anything because until he like properly put down his weapon or something, it was too dangerous to approach him. All they could do was just speak to him, like shout over to him and, and try and negotiate something with him. But Raoul Moat wasn't having any of it. He wasn't backing down at all. For the next six hours, he was in a standoff with police and they were getting nowhere. But throughout this six hours, they were able to gradually, very slowly get closer and closer and narrow the circle where they had him surrounded. So they were moving in. Eventually, around 8 p.m. that evening, police had moved in so close to him that they were only about 20 feet away from him. And it was at this point that Ralmo realizes that this could all be over very quickly. And suddenly he starts freaking out because he's lost the power, he's lost the control, and he needed to do something to get it back. So he lifted his shotgun and pressed it to his neck. And he shouted out to all those police officers that if they got any closer, he would do it. He would shoot himself, which is not what police wanted. They wanted to take him alive, not dead. They didn't want a dead body. They wanted to take Raoul Moat and get him put in prison for the rest of his life. So they couldn't get any closer to him. They were stopped in their tracks. Everything was halted. They were still trying to negotiate with him, but he wasn't having any of it. And so some police officers decided to use another tactic. They had these experimental taser guns on them, which by the way, had never been cleared for official use on the police force. So this was naughty of them to get these out, but they whipped out these taser guns and shot them at Raoul Moat. Because they were still experimental, however, they didn't work. These, these guns didn't work. They weren't cleared for use yet because they weren't finished. They hadn't been like, they hadn't gone through all the tests. It didn't work. And if anything, this just angered Raoul Mutt even more because I think he thought that they were trying to shoot at him. He, th I think he thought they were real bullets. There was no way for him to know that it was a taser gun and not a real gun. So now he was mad at police for trying to kill him. So anyway, the standoff continues. The negotiations continue. They're getting nowhere. And then guess who arrives at the national park? Raoul Mutt's father. That father that he's never met before, never spoken to before, the father that he didn't even know existed, arrived at the park because he wanted to try and talk Raoul down from potentially killing himself right now. Because remember, his dad had always wanted to be in his life. He had cared about Raoul Mert, but he'd been blocked from being in his life. So now he's hearing that his son is cornered in this park, threatening to shoot himself, and he feels like he could be the one to stop him. He thought that if he went down to that park and showed up for the first time and Raoul got a chance to meet and talk to his own dad, then that might stop him from, from killing himself. And police agreed that this could potentially be a useful tactic. So they got him past the cordons, they took him close-ish to where Raoul Moat was and the dad starts talking to him. But this only makes Raoul Moat even more angry. He was annoyed because his dad had never been in his life and the first and only time he decides to appear 
is right now when he's in a standoff with police. Like, Ralmote was just, he didn't want to hear it. And actually, the dad was only making matters worse until police actually had to escort him away because it, it was making it worse. And then another crazy twist happens in this case. This is potentially the craziest twist I've ever heard in a true crime case because someone else turned up at that national park to try and calm down Ralmote. Guess who that was? Paul Blooming Gascoigne? This part of the case is gonna sound completely made up, but you're gonna have to stick with me because this is 100% true, I promise you. Paul Gascoigne, Gaza, if you don't know, is a former English footballer. Very, very famous footballer. Even if you're not into football, you have probably seen Paul Gascoigne somewhere. He was in I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. It was on Weakest Link. He's been on loads of those kind of shows. He's been, like, he, he's pretty much everywhere or was, he is quite the national treasure. And you might be thinking, well, what does former English footballer Paul Gascoigne have to do with Raoul Moat and this whole case? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> Not a single thing. That's why this is so mad. Paul is able to laugh about this now. He's done interviews where he's been able to look back and laugh about his actions, but it's actually really sad what led to this because Paul Gascoigne used to, and actually still to this day, struggles really badly with alcoholism. It was a huge, huge problem in his life. And that is what influenced him on this particular night to go down to that park and try and talk to Raoul Moat. He was incredibly drunk. So basically, Paul Gascoigne had just been sat at home that night watching the TV. He was very, very drunk when the breaking news came on that they had Raoul Moat cornered in this park. He was threatening to shoot himself. And in that moment, when Raoul Moat's face popped up on the TV, Paul Gascoigne thought he recognized him. In his drunken state, he thought that Raoul Moat was one of his friends, like an old friend. And they were saying on the news that he was threatening to kill himself. And Paul Gascoigne's thinking, oh my God, I, I need to go and help my friend. So Paul calls a taxi to take him to Cragside. He's wearing his dressing gown and everything. Like he really didn't think this through, but he did gather a few things to take with him. He took a few cans of beer for the two of them to drink because he was aiming to actually be let all the way over to Raoul Moat so that he could sit and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and try and talk him down. So he took a bunch of cans of beer for the two of them to share. He took a fishing rod so that they had something to do. He took a blanket to keep his mate Raoul Moat warm. And he took a full loaf of tiger bread and a, and a box of chicken chunks so that they could make chicken sandwiches together. When he arrived at Cragside, he got out of the taxi and of course, police recognized him as soon as they saw him, famous footballer. They were like, what on earth are you doing here? And Paul said to him, he was like, oh, I'm here to see my mate, where's Morty? Like he's calling him Morty this whole time. He thinks that they're best mates. And police could tell that he was very, very drunk. And they were like, nah, we're, like, we're not gonna let you go in there. You're not going anywhere near that. And so Paul was like, well, well, I'll just go in there myself. I know where he is. I can tell where he is. And police were like, how? How do you know where he is inside this massive park? And Paul points up at this uh, helicopter and he goes, look, that helicopter's shining its light down on him. I'll just follow the light. And police turn to him and they go, Paul, that's a star. He was looking at the star. They all managed to laugh at the situation um, and they ended up getting Paul home safe that night. Turns out, Paul did actually recognize Raoul Moat on that news report. They weren't friends, they'd never been friends, but Paul used to go in the nightclub that Raoul used to be a bouncer at. So he'd recognized him, they'd had a few conversations, but because he was so drunk that night and he was also on a lot of drugs, um, I think he just kind of, forgot their connection. He recognized the photo and thought, oh, that's a friend of mine. But anyway, the Paul Gascoigne stuff aside, <laughs> let's actually get back to the timeline of the case. This standoff between Raoul Moat and the police continued all through the night and into the early hours of July 10th. It was clear that neither side was getting what they wanted. Raoul wasn't gonna give himself into police and police obviously weren't gonna let him go. So how was this gonna end? At 1.15 a.m. on July 10th, 2010, Raoul Mert fired the gun that was still pressed against his head and finally, this was all over. An ambulance was on hand throughout this whole standoff and so immediately Raoul Mert was transported to hospital to potentially be treated, but when he got there, he was pronounced dead on arrival. The next morning, the news broke that this manhunt was finally over and that Raoul Moat was dead. 
This whole thing had spanned six days in total and cost over 1.5 million pounds. His funeral was held a couple of weeks later and this is where we see a really weird phenomenon of Raoul Moat fans, right? People were traveling like all over the UK to this funeral in the Northeast. I mean, it wasn't a lot of people that were traveling around, but a significant enough amount of people for me to mention it in this video. There was one woman named Teresa who had traveled and brought her kids. She'd brought her kids to Raoul Moat's funeral. They'd traveled from the South Coast all the way to the top of the country for this because she loved Raoul Moat based on the news that she'd been hearing over the past few days. In fact, she was interviewed by a news broadcaster at the funeral because obviously this was so crazy that she traveled and brought her kids to this spree shooter's funeral. So basically, this is what she had to say. Teresa said, I absolutely love the man. I think he's great. The interviewer said, you don't worry about the message that that sends to your sons, given the crimes that this man committed. No, not at all, not at all. You think your sons should use Ralma as a role model? Yeah, actually I do. So that was Raoul Moat's funeral, really, really weird. And then the second funeral was Chris Brown's. And this is actually really sad in that his family actually asked Samantha Stobart, who survived her gunshot wounds, she survived this whole ordeal. They asked her not to go to her own boyfriend's funeral because they held some resentment towards her. Because of course, if Chris had never met Samantha Stobart, he would still be here today. He wouldn't have lost his life in such a tragic way. They kind of blamed Samantha for this. Of course, not full blame because she didn't shoot him. It was Raoul Moat that shot him, but it was because Chris had gotten caught up in Samantha's life that he had lost his life and they just didn't want her there. I just think it's sad that Samantha had to suffer in, in this context, I can understand the family feeling that way. But there was no way that Samantha could have prevented or stopped or or even known that this was gonna happen. How was she supposed to know that Raoul Moat was hiding out front of that house in a bush with a gun? You know what I mean? But she wasn't able to go and pay her respects to the man that she loved at his funeral because everyone felt she had responsibility for his death. On a slightly happier note though, now that Raoul Moat was gone, Marissa, his ex-girlfriend, managed to get custody of their two daughters again. And over the years, they finally saw the truth. They finally understood that their dad had been brainwashing them, gaslighting them this whole time, and that their mother did love them. She'd always loved them. She wasn't an awful person. And finally they could see that. In 2011, both accomplices, Carl and Kurum, were both found guilty of attempted murder for their part in the shooting of police officer David Rathband. Neither of them even touched the gun. And, and everyone knew that, the courts knew that, that it was Raoul Moat that pulled the trigger. But they all agreed that David Rathband would not have been shot that night if Carl and Kurum didn't do their part. They facilitated the shooting. They drove Raoul Moat out there. Kurum literally supplied his car for this shooting to happen. Kurum was sentenced to 20 years in prison for this. And Carl Ness was actually sentenced to 40, obviously because he had the same situation again with the shooting of Chris Brown and Samantha Stobart. He said that he didn't know that Raoul Moat was gonna shoot them when he went and that's why he sped away in the van and, and left him. But I don't know, how can we know that that's true? Because clearly he was happy going around with him for the days after that while they were on the run facilitating him shooting in other people, I think Carl Ness knew that, that Raoul Moat was gonna shoot that night. Going back to Officer David Rathband, who survived the shooting, like I said, but he was left with long lasting complications. He was left permanently blind. And this really, really affected him. He had to retire from his job as a police officer and he really, really struggled coming to terms with his new life and, and making all these adaptations. He couldn't drive anymore. He couldn't do most things for himself anymore. He needed help with a lot of things and, and he just could not get used to it. He hated it. On top of that, he knew that he was never gonna see his loved one's faces ever again. And all of this was just far too much for him to deal with. He tried to get on with his life, with his new normal for the next two years after the shooting. But in 2012, David Rathband, 
committed suicide in his house in the midst of a divorce with his wife as well. His friend at the time said, I wasn't surprised. I was heartbroken, but I wasn't surprised. I couldn't blame David. I couldn't be cross with him because I understand. He really, really struggled towards the end of his life. And it, it is so sad that it, came to such an end. But before he died, David Rathband had done a hell of a lot of charity work, especially for people like him in his situation that had been, you know, injured or disabled or something like that at work or as part of their work in, in the police force. He'd done so much charity work, in fact, that he was given a Pride of Britain award which is a big deal. He was very highly regarded. And the summer that he died, it was the summer of 2012, which was when we had the London Olympics and they were doing the whole uh, running with the torch ceremony and everything. They wanted loads of notable people throughout the UK to like run with this torch through the streets. And David Rathband was gonna be one of them because of all of the charity work he'd done. But unfortunately, he committed suicide before he was due to run with a torch. And so in his place, his daughter decided to do it and she did it blindfolded as a tribute to her father, which I thought was lovely. But that is all I have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching and thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. The link is also down below in the description and you will find an exclusive deal waiting for you there and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I could Cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you want to become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up because that would really help me out. If you want to watch another video, there's one, I'll recommend you one. Or if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can click this circle right here because I post true crime videos like this one all the time. Okay, see you later, bye.